Why would God create mankind when he is going to send 90% of them to an eternal torture chamber for not knowing slash loving him? A good God would not do that. It makes no sense. First of all, this person is not God. Therefore, he cannot tell us what good and evil is. It would just be his opinion. Second of all, there's no such thing as an eternal torture chamber. No one is going to receive everlasting life in hell. And the third point about 90% of people not being saved. I'm going to refute that in this video. I made a smaller video on TikTok and Instagram responding to that comment. And I just mentioned how I believe that most people will be saved. And I got comment after comment after comment from Christians, most likely dispensationalists, telling me that I'm wrong because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 that most people are going to hell and only a few people are going to heaven. And I actually responded to some of those comments saying that heaven and hell aren't even mentioned in this passage. This is what it actually says. This is not my interpretation. Enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it for the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life and there are few who find it so can y'all point out to me where in this passage it says that most people throughout all human history are going to go to hell and a small percentage maybe 10 percent, maybe one percent some christians even came up to me saying i did the math only one percent of people are going to be saved i don't care about what matthew did i care about what god said anyways of course this verse isn't saying anything like that in fact if you were to read it like that you would have to abandon biblical infallibility because if if you took it like that, it contradicts countless other scriptures. Now, I'm going to get back to Matthew 7 slash Luke 13 later in the video. But first, let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. When Yahweh said to Abraham, who was Abram at this time, go forth from your land and from your kin and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you all all the families of the earth will be blessed. What's this about all the families of the earth being blessed? I thought most people are going to hell according to these comments on YouTube and TikTok. Later on in Genesis chapter 17, now it happened that when Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless so that I may confirm my covenant between me and you and that I may multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God spoke with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. How many nations? Many, 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 many nations. Not just one, but many. And no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So how many nations is Abraham the father of? One, just the Jews? or many, many, many nations. Now, later on in Genesis 22, God said to Abraham once again, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have listened to my voice. So all within the first half of the book of Genesis, there is great judgment and also great salvation. Yes, of course, in Genesis 6, God flooded the entire earth and he was grieved in his heart because he saw that the thoughts of his heart, the man's heart was only evil continually. Now, in that particular situation, situation, of course, the gate was narrow and constricted that led to life. But what about after the flood and everybody who was alive on earth at that time was saved? Imagine being Noah and not experiencing any sort of opposition to God in your life. No one else on earth but you and your family. Could you possibly think that the, the way to life is constricted and narrow at that point? The reason why I point this out is because time exists. A lot of people seem to forget that when I say stuff like, I believe most humanity will be saved. They look around the world and say, there's not that many Christians around. There's a lot of uh, atheists and Muslims and uh, insert any religion you want to. Therefore, you're wrong and only a minority of people will be saved. Well, at this point clearly not everyone will be saved or not most people but there were times in human history where everyone was saved at the time of noah after all the wicked people died everyone at that point was saved and the point that i'm trying to make with genesis 12 and 17 and 22 let's go back to 22 real quick this is a prophecy in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed this is going to happen at some point in the future all of the nations all around the world are going to worship the lord 
This is a fact. I didn't make that up. This is just what the psalmist says in Psalm 22. This is a very famous psalm, yet most people haven't read the whole thing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my salvation are the words of my groaning. Now, this psalm is amazing because it tells the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And of course, in verse 22, we have the resurrection. I will surely recount your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. And then in verse 27, this is the end of the story. All the ends of the earth will remain remember and turn to Yahweh and all the families of the nations will worship before you for the kingdom is Yahweh's and he rules over the nations. So what is going to happen according to the scriptures? This isn't my interpretation. All of the families of the nations will worship God. Is that happening today, right now, at this moment? Can you see that happening right now? No, of course not. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that all the families of the nations will worship God. Now let's move on a bit later to the book of Isaiah. Now it will be that in the last days, the mountain of the house of Yahweh, the Lord will be established as the head of the mountains and will be lifted up above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. So according to this prophecy, the house of the mountain of Yahweh is established and will be lifted up above the hills and all the nations all around the world are going to stream to that mountain. And what are they going to say? They're going to say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us from his ways and that we may walk in his paths. This is what's going to happen. All the nations all around the world are going to repent. They're going to want to get instruction from God. Now, of course, is this happening right now? Is every single person in all of the nations wanting to go up to worship God? Obviously not. But also remember the state of the world world 3,000 years ago. There was only one nation that had the law of God. Romans calls it the oracles of God and the temple sacrifices and just closeness to the Lord in general. But here I am thousands of miles away in a completely different nation wanting to get instruction from God. This is why the next verse is extremely important as well. For from Zion the law will go forth and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into to plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. So at some point in the future, all of warfare is going to cease. The nations are going to turn their swords into plowshares. The scriptures literally say that nation will not lift up sword against nation. How on earth is this supposed to happen if apparently only so few people are going to be saved? And according to many peoples, in every era of time throughout all of human history, only only that many people will be saved. So I have to go to the Old Testament quite a bit for this video because a lot of people today have no idea what the Old Testament teaches, what the prophecies are about the salvation of the world, uh, the blessing of all the nations through Abraham, and of course the establishment of the mountain of the Lord in Jerusalem where his law goes forth to teach all of the nations so that they repent and come to Christ. Basically meaning so that the world can be saved. But here in Daniel chapter 7, uh, this is a very famous passage. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days was seated. His clothing was white like snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with fire. Its wheels were burning fire and a river was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. So this is Daniel seeing a vision clearly of the Ancient of Days. This is God himself and he kept looking in the night visions and behold hold with the clouds of heaven. One like a son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and came near before him. This is the Messiah. This is the man, Christ Jesus. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and the men of every tongue might serve him. Notice how it doesn't say that a small amount of people from the nations and some people from every tongue might serve him. No, the purpose of the Son of Man coming to the Father in heaven is so that all the peoples, all the nations, and men of every tongue might serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not be taken away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Yes, Jesus Christ came to save individuals, and he's also the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of 
the entire world. He is not the propitiation just for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. Now, the coolest part about this is that this prophecy says that Jesus is going to be served by all the nations, all the peoples. And what did Jesus tell us to do in Matthew chapter 28? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of some people within all the nations or all the nations. You're supposed to make all the nations follow Jesus. That's the goal of the gospel. That was the purpose for Jesus coming into the world baptizing them, who again? Some of the people within the nations or all the nations. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them, who's them? The nations, not just some people within the nations. To keep all that I commanded you and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now remember, keeping that Isaiah chapter two passage in mind, why is this possible? How is it possible that all the nations are going to come to Jesus? How are all of them going to uh, keep what God commanded them? Well, of course, first of all, it's because God said so and his mountain is established. Remember in the Old Testament when Israel had king after king after king who were just absolutely wicked. And of course there are some good kings like David and Solomon and Hezekiah, but even them, they committed sin. They were imperfect. But with Jesus, the mountain of the house of Yahweh is established as head above all the mountains, a perfect king, a perfect representative for the holiness of God. And here we see in Isaiah chapter nine as well, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the third of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forevermore. So the story is, all right, the Messiah comes, he starts his kingdom, and he's going to gradually bring peace throughout the entire earth. And it's not going to end. And how is this going to be accomplished? The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. God himself will accomplish this. I've talked about this before with some people and they look at me like I'm crazy. Like what? You really believe that all the people around the world are going to come to repentance and Christ? out of their own free will they've even said that like do you really think that's going to happen and it's like no i don't think that that's going to happen because they don't have free will they're enslaved to sin but what's going to happen god himself is going to accomplish this the holy spirit is the one who convicts the world of sin and grants people repentance gives them the gift of faith i don't believe that humans out of their own free will can just oh i'm not going to be a sinner anymore i'm going to go find christ now because i want to be a good person now no people are enslaved to sin and by god's grace they are convinced convicted of that sin and they are regenerated so that they can see spiritually now. They see sin for what it really is. And that's why they come to Christ. And this, according to the scripture, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the entire world. So now back to Matthew chapter seven, after getting the full context of all these prophecies telling us that all the nations, all the families within all the nations are going to be blessed and worship Jesus at some point. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. This actually fits perfectly because Jesus at this point hasn't yet ascended to the Father in heaven to receive the kingdom that is supposed to subdue the whole world. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life and there are few who find it. How many disciples did Jesus have at this time? Not millions as he does today. And how many unbelievers were alive at this time? Clearly way more than believers. And it's still true today that there are more unbelievers than believers. But Clearly, no one can deny this. There has been significant progress with the gospel. So many people ha have been saved. And those prophecies about Jesus being king and subduing the earth and bringing more and more people to repentance, they're coming true. I don't know how long God is going to take with subduing the earth and bringing the whole world to repentance, but I know what's going to happen. So yeah, Jesus is talking about the current situation with his disciples, not about the situation in 2000 years or 5,000 years or 10,000 years. And there's another biblical principle here being taught. Jesus is the only way. He is the gate. And again, yeah, that's John chapter 10. That's the same word that is used here the gate. Another thing to point out is that this word broad here can also be translated as spacious. There's an infinite amount of false religions because people invent new religions every single day. So yes, there is only one way of salvation that is so narrow. It's only through Jesus Christ. And also there are an infinite number of ways to get this wrong. I say all that to point out that this is not a verse you can just rip out of context and tell other people that this verse has to mean that most people are going to hell and a minority of people are going 
quote unquote to heaven so in that sense the way to destruction is always going to be broad no matter what also what did jesus say in the very next chapter and i say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with abram isaac and jacob in the kingdom of heaven this one is a prophecy this one is about the future it's saying many will come from east and west what about matthew chapter 13 here's some more prophetic parables that jesus told the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field and this is the smallest of all seeds seeds that fits perfectly the kingdom of heaven started very small just a few disciples here but there's a huge but here oh, there's a huge but when it is fully grown it is the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches he spoke another parable to them the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three seda of flour until it was all leaven now we don't use those words in english very often but this is the nlt it says the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour it permeated some parts of the dough no every part of the dough so hopefully at this point i've proved to you based on scripture that all the nations are going to remember and return to the lord and worship him if you don't believe that then you just don't believe scripture because i just quoted a bible verse right there now the obvious end times question a lot of people will have at this point when i explain this is is this going to happen before jesus comes back or after he comes back well, according to Hebrews chapter 10, it says that Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies are put as a footstool for his feet. Well, there you have it. Jesus is not going to come back because he's waiting from that time when he ascended to the Father. He's waiting from that time until all his enemies are put as a footstool for his feet jesus is the king right now and he is reigning and the purpose of his kingdom is to go throughout the world preach the gospel and save the world and again i have to point this out i am thousands of miles away from physical jerusalem right now but i'm worshiping him in spirit and in truth and let's go to psalm chapter 72 may jesus have dominion from sea to sea from the river to the ends of the earth let the desert creatures kneel before him and his enemies lick the dust. Let the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands bring a present. The kings of Sheba and Seba offer tribute and let all kings bow down to him. All nations serve him. Another translation says, may desert tribes bow down before him. You can't get clearer than this. All of these people all around the world, all the nations, the desert tribes, the people who we thought couldn't really be reached, the people thousands upon thousands thousands of miles away from physical Jerusalem with that physical temple and the physical sacrifices. All these desert tribes around the world are going to bow down before him. How are they going to do that? Of course, uh, by the power of God. That's the only way. If God don't do it, it won't get done. <laughs> so yeah, based on all of these scriptures that I showed in this video and way more, I could get into way more, but that's enough for today. Just the basics of this belief that because at some point in the future, all the nations are going to bow the knee to Jesus. And of course, based on how populations work, the population is going to increase. So at that time where the whole world has come to repentance, there's going to be more people alive then than today and way in the past as well probably combined so that's why i believe most people will be saved and at the very least a whole lot more people will be saved than what your average evangelical today will say will be saved i honestly can't believe that there are people in my comments saying stuff like, oh i did the math according to my calculations only three percent or one percent another person said one percent like dude repent that's all i have to say <laughs> the scriptures call the number of the saved as many as the sand on the seashore and as many as the stars of heaven it also says a great multitude that no one could number anyways remember to like and subscribe so that these videos can be seen by more people but that's gonna be it for today i love you guys so much